President Biden travels to Connecticut Friday in an effort to sell his social and climate package to the public. He's planning to focus on the need to invest in child care, highlighting the barriers those costs carry for working families. It comes at a precarious time for the Biden White House. The cost of living is going up, which is raising fears of inflation. And it comes as progressives grow increasingly vocal in refusing to compromise with moderates on the president's $3.5 trillion social and climate plan. More on that in a moment. This afternoon, President Biden said the U.S. is at a critical moment for turning the corner on the pandemic. We have to do more to vaccinate the 66 million unvaccinated people in America. It's essential. The vaccine requirements that we started rolling out in the summer are working. They're working. The Labor Department is going to soon be issuing an emergency rule for companies with 100 or more employees to implement vaccination requirements in their, among their workforce. Every day, we see more businesses implementing vaccination requirements, and the mounting data shows that they work. The administration's vaccine mandate for companies with over 100 workers is in the final stages of review. It's part of an effort to jolt economic recovery and alleviate supply bottlenecks impacting countless businesses and consumers. Some potential good news for the economy, the number of Americans filing first-time unemployment claims has dropped to a new pandemic low. 293,000 people filed new jobless claims for the week ending October 14th. That is below the 300,000 mark for the first time since March 2020. For more, let's bring in Ed O'Keefe, Meredith McGraw, and Eliza Collins. Ed is CBS News senior White House and political correspondent. Meredith is a national political correspondent for Politico. And Eliza is a politics reporter for The Wall Street Journal. Welcome to all of you. It is good to have you on this Red and Blue Friday, as we call it, also known as Thursday to the rest of the world. So, Ed, uh, let me start with you. Joe Biden heads to Rome, then Scotland for the G20 um, and UN climate conferences. Here is House Speaker Nancy Pelosi discussing how much is riding on climate change for Democrats. Let's listen to some of that. It is a level of urgency uh, that uh, is an imperative that we get this job done in preparation for COP26, which is right around the corner, and to do so that helps us honor our responsibilities, but also share with other countries, developing countries, technology or resources that they need to meet their responsibilities for the children. So at what's at stake here for the president? How might negotiations on this bill impact the president's standing on the global stage? If, if climate change hasn't been addressed as part of the Build Back Better plan, uh, it certainly would, would puncture uh, the U.S. attempts to, to get the rest of the world on board with, with really ambitious attempts to curb greenhouse gas emissions and, and the ongoing climate change across the world. In fact, John Kerry, his top climate envoy, who's been hopscotching the world to try to get other countries on board with big agreements ahead of that meeting in Scotland, said a similar thing to the Associated Press in an interview, saying, look, if Congress can't get it done by the end of the month, uh, you know, the, the, the country's reputation uh, on this is a bit is a bit punctured because the, the, the original hope here at the White House was that this would have been done by now and he'd be able to go to this meeting in Scotland and say, look what we did. And if we can do it, you can do it, too. Mm -hmm. Instead, it may be some sense of, well, look what we're about to do or look what we might do or look what we didn't do. And that will make it harder to convince bigger economies like China or places like Saudi Arabia and Mexico, where Kerry's headed uh, in, in the closing days before heading to Glasgow, uh, to try to seal the deal and get as many big economies on board. Uh, all of this speaks to how so much of what this White House wants to do is held up right now by two things. One, the pandemic, which understandably makes it harder to be as ambitious as they'd like to be to put the president out on the road, to hold the kinds of events or forward planning that they'd like to do, knowing that so many are still sick. The other is the fate of his legislative agenda. The longer Democrats go on hemming and hawing over the price and the ambition of this and how long it'll run for and what exactly will be in it, again, the longer it is for them to think ahead to other things that could get done or to be able to implement these things that they, by now, were hoping to be thinking about putting in place uh, for the coming years. 
And on that point, Eliza, earlier this week, Speaker Pelosi said that Democrats have some tough choices to make about scaling back their three and a half trillion dollar social and climate proposal. What are progressives saying about that? Well, I think it's widely accepted at this point that it's going to have to be less than that original $3.5 trillion package that was proposed because there are a handful of centrist members who say that just costs too much. So at first, progressives are not happy with that. They want $3.5 trillion. They think that's not enough as it is. They've kind of come around to accept that it will have to go down, but they don't want it to be less program. So basically what they're proposing is to keep all of the programs programs that have been proposed, but just do them for shorter time frames. And their argument there is that they'll become so popular that when it comes time to renew them, it will be politically impossible for Congress to just let them expire. So they've been making this argument. They made it yesterday, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, in a letter to Speaker Pelosi. Basically, now that they've accepted it's going to have to go down in size, they're saying, well, let's at least have influence over what that looks like. Meredith, meantime, uh, Americans are paying more at the grocery store and at gas stations, and now the nation is bracing for higher home heating prices this winter. Now, the White House keeps saying that this is temporary, but are they giving a sense of how long people can expect to be paying these higher prices? Well, these forecasted numbers that came out really don't bode well for the Biden administration right now. Basically, what the... Um, the Energy Information Administration was forecasting was that Americans could see their heating prices go up over 50 percent this coming winter. And some of that is calculated um, on you know, the, the prices of, of oil and gas, but also predictions for what kind of winter we're going to have. And it seems like a colder one is, is potentially on track for that. So that just adds to um, the, the number of, of big issues that the Biden administration is facing right now when it comes to um, things like inflation and really the pocketbook issues that people are dealing with right now. Um, higher oil and, and uh, gas prices, those are things that are going to be reflected in your, your heating bills um, come this winter and really could be a, a huge burden on some families. Um, as Politico reported, the Biden administration has been talking with some gas executives about um, trying to work with them on, on, on pricing, but they're really scrambling to show that they're trying to make a dent on tackling inflation here. Um, the Los Angeles port, it was announced that they're going to be open 24 hours, and that comes as there have been concerns about uh, whether or not the, the supply chain is going to be ready for the holiday season and is going to be able to um, face the huge consumer demands that we have Come holiday time. So it looks like right now it could be a, a tricky Christmas for uh, the Biden White House. And so far they've said that this is just temporary. This is because of the pandemic and the coronavirus. They anticipated that there were going to be some, you know, initial stumblings with the economy as they try to get things back on track. But so far there's no um, real set prediction of when we might see changes here. Right. Um, switching gears, Eliza, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is trying to revive voting rights legislation. Did he lay out next steps and what are its chances of uh, its chance for passage? He has laid out next steps. So he said that the Senate is going to take up this voting rights legislation next week. And that's a big deal because they had basically been putting it on hold while Senator Joe Manchin said that he was going to work to get some Republican support. That is looking very, very unlikely, which goes back to your question about passage. This looks like it will not pass. It's going to be subject to the 60 vote um, Senate filibuster. There are 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans and right now, it is not clear if any Republicans will support it. Earlier on, Senator Lisa Murkowski, a Republican, had said she supported some voting rights legislation and was going to be working with Senator Manchin. But it's not even clear at this moment if she will be signed on to it or if others. So uh, this is a priority for the base. This is a priority for Democrats. So Senate Majority Leader Schumer has basically moved forward with it. But it looks like it's not going to pass. 
Hmm. All right, we'll continue to watch that. In the meantime, we're learning former President Trump has been ordered to give a video deposition in a lawsuit. Who is ordering that, and what is the case about? Comes out of a, a, a judge in, in the New York in New York City is saying essentially he has to give. Uh, a deposition later this month, and this stems from a 2015 incident involving Mexican protesters outside Trump Tower. Uh, the judge saying that he's got to sit for this deposition by the end of this month. Uh, it's one of several different legal challenges the former president faces. Of course, the other ones that get more attention involve his taxes and his business practices, the defamation lawsuits uh, regarding women who've made accusations against him. But in this case, it's one related to protests that were held outside Trump Tower. It involves him, his former head of security, Kurt Schiller, uh, and is a reminder that uh, despite the fact that we know he's making plans to run again in 2024, at least hints at it, uh, and is going to play an active role in helping Republicans get elected this year and next year across the country, he also faces real significant legal challenges still. Well, Meredith, the former president is also continuing to repeat baseless claims about a somehow fraudulent election system. He went so far as to tell supporters not to vote in the next two elections if Republicans are not able to, quote, solve alleged voter fraud. So how has this played out in the past? Well, I'll tell you what, right now, um, after that statement was released, I got text messages from Republican officials and text messages from Democratic officials with very different opinions mm, on that. Republican officials who said, uh, who were referring to the Georgia special election and the effect some of Trump's similar words had on voter turnout there, and then Democrats who said, we hope he says more of this. Um, and when it comes to mm. what happened in, in Georgia in the special election, um, after the former president had been saying over and over again that um, the election had been rigged, uh, there was widespread voter fraud, um, that led to some voter suppression. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the big newspaper there in Georgia, um, did an analysis of voters and those who came out in the special election for those, those two Senate uh, runoff elections. And they found that um, over 750,000 people who voted in the presidential election didn't vote in that special election. And a lot of them were from uh, very heavy Republican rural um, Trump counties. They just didn't show up to the polls. And they accounted a lot of that to, the, the, to Trump's rhetoric about um, the, the, the election being rigged. And when he makes statements like this, I think there are a lot of Republicans who are bracing themselves, hoping that that doesn't affect turnout. Um, Trump's spokesperson, I was you know, talking to them today about that statement, actually. And you know, they were saying the president's just, the former president is just focused on election integrity, but there really are concerns that it, it could affect turnout if he, if he keeps pushing that type of message. You know, on a somewhat related note, Meredith, I'm just curious as well. You talked about getting uh, text messages from both Republicans and Democrats after um, hearing that from the, the president, from former President Trump. Is there a sense among some Democrats that they actually would welcome increased activity by the former president um, as a way to perhaps motivate Democratic voters, um, you know, at a time when we have seen a gap, for instance, I think the latest polling in Virginia showed a bit of an enthusiasm gap between Democrats and, and Republicans. Um, is that something that you hear at all from Democrats? Because we have seen clearly Democratic candidates try to tie their Republican opponents to former President Trump. Um, I'm just curious, uh, since you mentioned your conversations with these Democrats, is that something they talk to you about at all? Well, right now, President Biden's poll numbers have been declining. He's dealing with a lot of real challenges right now, and a lot of Democrats would much rather see the upcoming elections be a referendum on the former president than a lot of uh, the, the current policies and the way things are right now. Yeah, so I, yeah, I was just curious because it's something that um, certainly um, we have seen play out where you know, you have these Democrats um, talking privately about how they really are trying to get people motivated and get people enthusiastic about what the Biden administration has done. But then when they talk about, say, voting rights legislation or police reform, these are areas where there has clearly been some disappointment for um, some of those activists and some of those um, who have tried to get people 
um, motivated, and, and so it'll be interesting to see how all of that plays out. All right, um, a bit of a tangent there, but Eliza, on Wednesday, the White House formally rejected an attempt by former President Trump to assert executive privilege over documents related to January 6th. Now, Ed asked about the precedent that could be setting for future occupants of the Oval Office. Let's listen to that. You can understand that you're opening potentially a Pandora's box here. Actually, we don't, we don't see first. it that way. I understand why you're asking this question. Yeah. We talked about this a little bit last week as well. I think it is ultimately important for people to understand and remember that January 6th was an incredibly dark day, one of the darkest days in our democracy. Uh, there was an insurrection on our nation's capital. What we're talking about here is getting to the bottom of that. Shouldn't everybody want to get to the bottom of that? Democrats, Republicans, people who have no political affiliation whatsoever. I will reiterate that we're going to assess and review, as is standard in the process, the documents and uh, any efforts to exert executive privilege on a case-by-case -case basis. And we'll provide you updates on those as those processes proceed. Eliza, the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol riot is upping the pressure on former aides of Donald Trump who have so far refused to comply with subpoenas. What steps exactly are they taking? Right. So this committee has come out and they've sent out subpoenas to former aides of President Trump, who I think were waiting to see what the White House would end up doing. Now they can go forward and take this to court. Now, it's hard for Congress to do this. It's been about decades, 100 years since they actually have arrested someone, but they can do that. Congress has the power. If someone does not comply with a subpoena, they can move forward. And they're moving forward right now with Steve Bannon, um, who has not complied. So we're going to have to keep watching. But next week, the committee will vote on this, and then they'll take it to the House floor, where it is expected to pass. Democrats control the House. Um, and so this is the com a committee that is bipartisan technically. There are a couple of Republicans along with Democrats, but the Republicans on the committee are Republicans who have been very critical of the Trump, Trump administration, of the former president, and their reaction to January 6th. All right, a lot to watch here in the coming days. Ed O'Keefe, Meredith McGraw, and Eliza Collins, thank you all very much.